I take part in a research group at NTNU in Trondheim, whose uh, ambit ambitious purpose, naively ambitious purpose, would someone say, is to research how the political economy of natural resources and raw materials within countries and between countries has influenced historical development from the 1870s until today. One of multiple foci is on resource conflicts. How they have generated uh, the coming of war, economic warfare, during war, and outcome of wars. The research group is currently developing a research project on economic blockade and its lessons in the age of the two world wars. And my talk today is inspired by this effort and must be considered work in progress. Whereas I, in my abstract, uh, announced two sections of my talk, I have decided uh, to divide it into three parts. So I will add an extra part to, my, to it, and therefore I put the Nordic region in parentheses. Well, it's divided into three parts. I first introduced the relevance of the international conflict over access to natural resources for the coming of World War II, which ends with a research uh, desideratum pertaining particularly to British perceptions and policy in the context of the international raw materials cleavage of the 1930s. The next section presents Germany's metals policy policy before the war to show how the lessons from the resource blockade, from the economic blockade during the First World War generated a committed policy to fight a long war. Finally, I intend to show how, how Germany's pursuit of na natural resources in the Nordic region was an, was an expensive uh, it was expensive under the constraint of the economic blockade. So, first part. No, the out outline, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so, the three parts. Then, I start with a quote. The quotes from uh, Charles Kenneth Late's article in ap April 1938 aptly describes how he saw the resource conflict of the 1930s generated the coming of World War II. He was right indeed, and he was not alone. Professor Light was a distinguished geologist at the University of Wisconsin, who for long had taken interest in how the international political economy of minerals had effective international relations and ultimately the issue of peace and war. He was chairman of the U.S. expert group set up in 1936 to elaborate the incoming international conflicts over access to and exchange of raw materials. The final report of the expert groups, rep uh, uh, oh, oh, no. the, the final report of the of the report, the final report from the expert group was authored by the economy professor Eugene Staley titled Raw Materials in Peace and War, and published by the Council on Foreign Relations in 1937. However, Prof Professor Leitz's foreign affairs article elaborated more concisely how the raw materials conflict between those countries who had abundant access to natural resources, that is, the future allies, United States, United Kingdom, Russia, and France, and those who had not such access, the future Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Contemporary observers had then for some years referred to this conflict as a cleavage between the haves and the have-nots. Although the Second World War had multiple and complex causes, it is well acknowledged among historians that pursuit Pursuit of land and natural resources drove the autocratic Axis powers to challenge the fragile world order 
in the 1930s, and that the ultimate method was conquest. Japan attacked Manchuria in 1932, and Italy, Italy Abyssinia in 1935. Germany embarked on expansion in 1938, which ended with the attack on the Soviet Union in 1941. The Axis powers increasingly found together since 1936, not only in, co in compensatory autarky policies, but since 1939 in terms of military alliance as well. The entire aspiration of Lebensraum, whether we think of the Japanese notion of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, or the German notion of Großraumwirtschaft in Europe, and even the Italian notion of Impero Italiano around the Mediterranean, was all predicated on the need to control agricultural land and industrial resources, food and minerals. As for Germany, the expansionist Lebensraum ideology had roots in, the, in imperial Germany and indeed been formulated by Hitler in Mein Kampf. His message was that German, German territory was too small for the German population and thereby making it unable to feed itself. Hitler clearly anticipated the pursuit of land and resources in Nazi Germany's foreign policy. The Nazi notion of Lebensraum targeted the Soviet Union, in particular Ukraine, and was justified by consistently referring to the might of the United States, the United Kingdom, France and Russia, which disallowed Germany access to imperial resources and land for their, ex uh, their excess population. The Nazi view was in a fair way right. The international raw materials cleavage of the 1930s was embedded in the hierarchical and exclusive order of exclusive world order of raw materials access and distribution, which had been settled by the have nations, United States, United Kingdom and France after the First World War. It was an un unjust peace, according to them. This order, was, this order settled after the First World War was indeed not static, but the raw materials conflict endured. The raw materials issue had been raised in the League of Nations on several occasions since 1920, but claims by the have-nots for international redistribution of, con uh, of uh, of, of um, colonies and mandate territories were baffled, uh, uh, were baffled uh, by the haves, who remained in control of imperial resource flows and controlled the sea routes, whereas the have-nots developed their notions of autarchic living, autarchic living space. The only report commissioned by the League uh, League of Nations Assembly that addressed the raw materials problem is illustrative. It was called for by the British Foreign Secretary Samuel Hoare in September 1935 as he addressed the potential threat of raw materials problem to world peace and prosperity. The League appointed a committee with government representation which mandate ignored the views of the have-nots, fully ignored. The report of, of 1937 reads, in red here, the, com the committee did not regard it as its function to discuss the dis distribution uh, of the territories from which raw materials were drawn. The report elaborated the raw materials problem only in terms of restrictive commercial policies that distorted international trade and pay payments. So the, the, the choral hull, reciprocity philosophy. It said nothing at all about the cleavage and the preferential geopolitics that was generating the coming of war. The League's Assembly had indeed invited have-not countries to participate, but the man that might have been the reason why Germany and Italy refused to participate, whereas Japan was represented by its Berlin ambassador. Historians have con convincingly shown that it was the British government who mastered the committee's word, uh, work. Let, 
Late published an updated article in March 1939, after German, uh, Germany had crushed Czechoslovakia and Japan had uh, conquered large parts of China. He indeed acknowledged that the conquest would not redeem the needs of the have-nots, but also that the have-nations focus on re-establishing liberal commercial policy, a liberal commercial order. Um, and free air, free air exchange did deliberately circumvent the problem. He regarded that policy had no appeasement effect whatsoever and concluded, ultimately, appeasement, appeasement may have to include some sort of collective guarantee of equality, of access to raw materials. To avoid, to avoid war, late in fact suggested that the have-nations must give up some of their imperial controls and accommodate the have-nots claim for access. He did, however, not say how this should be technically done. An expert institution, uh, a political institution, supranational institution, we don't know. But there were many uh, who leveled suggestions the, the, uh, after, uh, when commenting upon his article. But, and, and he also implied that forceful, concerted Western action, read war, might be the ultimate solution. For many good reasons, Leit's perspective has found little room in post-war historiography. First, it was far too late, of course, as Japan and Germany had for long had it committedly for conquest and would continue to do so. Second, they have new and this, is, this leads me to my, to, to, um, further in the talk. The Haves knew they were superior and would win in the long run if they joined forces. In, Lo in London, the idea lingered that they, uh, an economic blockade, a naval economic blockade, would cripple Germany's ability to fight the long war. Literature has shown that much work was done since the, since the Committee of Imperial Defense uh, saw to that the Advisory Committee on Trading and Blockade in Times of War was established in 1925, sorry, 24. And Britain had, uh, had uh, established the Industrial Intelligence Center in 1929-30 to study uh, potential war uh, developments. And Patrick Salmon, in 1983, has convincingly showed, exemplified by, by Swedish iron ore, that British assessments rested on trust in the effects of economic blockade. We know as well that William Medlicott's study of World War II and Harry Hinsley's study of British intelligence during World War II uh, show, sh sh ha have showed that British government assumed that Germany would run out of vital raw materials after only 15 to 18 months of war. British intelligence assumed even shorter period. But Germany fight, was able to fight the war for almost, almost close to six years. And it was not the raw materials that made them lose. So there is something here that needs further in investigation. And this is exactly what I, su I, I suggest and my, my research group to do, to study how the anticipation of, the anticipation of blockade and its effect Structure formed policies toward Germany, or the, the, the no, uh, have-not nations in the 1930s. We know, I know from other uh, literature that planners or, or, or in, 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 in Whitehall uh, Ministry were thinking of, of, of giving some sort of appeasement concessions to Hitler. For instance, support of his Grossraumwirtschaft in Southeast Europe. 
but this seems to have disappeared. And there might be experts in, in the room that know more about, about this, because I don't have full knowledge of the literature. But this needs further research. How did the raw materials cleavage structure British policy, the anticipation of the blo blockade? Now I go to my second part, which is based on an article on my colleague, a, a, a member of the research group, Jonas Schanner. Uh, and you, you see the title of the, uh, of the article. It was recently published in the English Historical Journal. In this article, he refutes one, fun as is a quote, one fundamental assumption of the Western powers' long war strategy and casts doubt on the conventional wisdom regarding the unpreparedness of Germany for a long war. And it's ex exactly uh, his argument I'm going to present to you now. And, 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 and his article has, has convinced me that the research desideratum I raised uh, with regard to Britain is important. Well, uh, his article um, on non-ferrous metals policy a sector crucial to the armament sector because these metals were needed to pursue armored steel, shells and ammunition, strong, uh, strong and malleable light metals are, uh, alloys for aircraft and engines, electric equipment, etc., is highly relevant. But before I present a condensed version of Schoenow's article, a comment on the historiography on Hitler's rearmament is necessary. Based on the views of the reports by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey after World War II, it was long assumed that Hitler had, did not pre prepare for a long and costly war because he did not want to reduce civilian German consumption. He didn't dare to challenge his population. Therefore, he was a risk taker who fought cheap blitz wars successfully. and which provi provided booty to pay for the next blitz war. Alan Milward, a friend of Norwegian historians, was a major advocate for this blitz war hypothesis. In the 2000s, however, German historians have convincingly shown that Hitler, since 1934, started pre preparing for a long war, including Jonas Schoenner who has also studied investments from a macroeconomic perspective. Well, then to Schander's understanding. Much of the Nazi war planning bureaucracy that started elaborating a potential war effort in 1934 had experienced with imperial Germany's huge dependence on overseas imports and the effects of Anglo-American blockade economic blockade, when they had been responsible for German supply management during the Great War or First World War. Their view was that their measures had allowed Germany to continue the war up to 1918. Well before the, before the World, War, uh, World War I ended in 1918, the German government, imperial government had commissioned multiple studies of the economic effects of the blockade on the armaments industry, and studies of which measure had proved to compensate for the blockade. The Nazi government retrieved these reports, which covered all important aspects of metals policy, such as recycling, substitution, conservation, exploration of domestic ores, metal mobilization, what we today call urban mining, scrap collection, stockpiling, rationing systems, investments in uh, smelters and refinery, metals trade, and overall organization of these policies. Ooh. The studies were classified and kept secret and condensed into a kind of encyclopedia by the Heereswaffenhaft, 
here as Waffenamt, the agency responsible for the technical development of armaments and the organization of the production of ammunition. A crucial lesson said, first, that synthesis, synthetics, sorry, such as plastics, could only modestly substitute metals. Second, that transformation would take two years before they were effective. The elaborate metal policy started in 1934, in shadows of Yalmar Schacht's new plan, and was there forcefully reinforced through the four-year plan from 1936. Subsidy, subsidies were introduced for domestic extraction of abundant uh, non-ferrous ores, which grossly increased domestic production of lead and zinc. For scarce domestic ores, the policy was to preserve them as reserves to be exploited after outbreak of war. An exploration scheme was introduced to identify, and, uh, identify scarce ore fields simult simultaneously as essential ores and metals will be purchased from abroad when the price was low. The combined purpose of these measures was to build up stockpiles, which would bridge the supply gap between the outbreak of war and the point in time when the hidden reserves, that is German ores and available metals could be, to be recycled, could be mobilized. An urban mining scheme was also established. So I, I will jump, no, I take it, I will, I might really skip the Nordic countries and continue with Nazi Germany in the 30s. A committed substitution policy was introduced in 1934 as well. As the use of metals for some purposes were prohibited and their substitutes ordered. No market. For instance, to save copper for munitions, aluminium would substitute copper in electric cables. Already in 1936-37, the consumption of, of copper had been reduced by 31%. Conception reductions were substantial for tin, nickel, and lead as well. The four-year plan massively increased substitution research and fostered the, the exchange of substitu substitution know-how among industries and companies. Subsidies, subsidies were used to build up production capacity for zinc, aluminium, and vanadium, the three most used substitution metals. Germany ha had abundant amounts of van vanadium, which consumption consumption had increased almost threefold, threefold by 1938-39. The content of nickel in construction steel was reduced by 80%, molybdenum by 34 and chrome by 31. Allowing these metals to be used for armored steel. The four-year plan exceeded its substitu uh, substitution targets by far. It was a success, not a failure, as many historian, ha as historians have believed. Have assumed. Further, although German copper refineries reached the war planners' expansion targets by more than doubling their production by 1938, and copper stocks were estimated to last for minimum nine months, the planners knew well that there was still a major unexploited potential, potential to, hence, to enhance recycling of copper. Uh, the urban mining scheme to collect church bells and copper pans was ordered. More importantly, the Wehrmacht had resisted to substitute brass with steel in ammunition. Only in August 1939, as Germany attacked Poland, was the conversion to steel shells ordered and anti-craft weapons, and soon after this occurred for other types of shells, bullet cores, detonators, and driving bands. This followed a substitu substitution plan for ammunition ordered by Hitler, Hitler a few months earlier to come into effect in case of war. Data on wartime uh, uh, conservation and substitution confirms the high expectations the Germans war planners had. So one might ask why, why then invade Norway and Denmark when you are sufficiently supplied? Yeah, the answer is Germany didn't take, attack Norway and Denmark to access natural resources. It was military strategic reasons. It was the Navy's argument that uh, Germany needed a, a bridgehead in Norway to fight the British in the North Atlantic. 
and to challenge the economic blockade. So, but in the very moment, and, 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 but war planners had knew well the Nordic countries' resources and had planned how they could be exploited, if preferably by, by trade policy, but also, if possible, uh, I, 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 in case of invasion and occupation. Uh, and I guess I have not time. I'm, she's giving me the red card already. So, so. But if you have uh, questions pertaining to the Nordic countries, so please ask them. <laughs> Thank you.